And now we return to local news and, first of all, sports news. Enfield Ignatians produced a battling second-half display against Chelmsford, but it wasn't enough as Emil Hertz's side suffered a 24-17 defeat in London North East 2. Ignatians were reduced to 14 men when Mickey Piper was sin-binned and Chelmsford opened up a 17-5 advantage by the interval. Luke Ellis grabbed the Enfield try. The Blue and Golds were much improved after the break. Their pack started to boss the contact areas and their pressure paid off as Sean Engelbrecht went over with Jordan Wilson adding the extras. Enfield stat Frank Stavrou fed Ellis who went over to level the contest. The Chelmsford side did manage to get their hand on the ball late on and scored a converted try from J.B. Fisher to seal the win. Ignatians tackled South Woodham Ferrers in their penultimate league fixture at Donkey Lane on the 5th of April. Ignatians 2s all but wrapped up the Harps Middlesex Merit 2 title after a hard-fought 24-19 win over the Hampstead 3s. Enfield's tries came from Sean Rogers, Alberto de Dio, Sean Coyne and Paul Duke. There was disappointment for Ignatian Threes, who lost 41-0 to Datchworth Hearts Middlesex Merit 3. Enfield's under-15s were closing in on the Hearts Middlesex Division 3 title after a defeat, after a default 45-0 win against Wellin, who conceded the fixture. The under-12s combined forces with Old Grammarians and claimed 47-14 and 63-0 wins against Finchley and Pinner in the Middlesex Shield. The under-9s clinched 12-5 and 15-5 victories against Stockwood Park, while the under-8s had mixed fortunes against the same opposition. An impressive 2-2 draw at second-placed Dulwich Hamlet could not prevent Enfield Town from slipping back into the Ryman Premier Division's relegation zone on Saturday. Goals from Jamie Richards and Bradley Quinton helped Town to twice come from behind and extend their unbeaten run to six matches, but East Thurrock, United's stunning 6-1 triumph over Hendon, saw them climb a point above George Borg's men in the battle to avoid the drop. However, Borg had nothing but praise for the efforts of his players. We battled well and played well for the entire 90 minutes, Borg said. The lads were outstanding and it was a terrific performance against a side who were going for the title. I think a draw was a fair result and the Dulwich manager came up to me after the match to say he couldn't believe the transformation in our side in the past few months. I took over a side who were dead and buried when I got here and myself and Bradley have worked our socks off to try and turn things round. Town made the better start, but they fell behind against the run of play on 29 minutes when Aaron Oztuma found Dean Lodge in space and he swept the ball into the net. The visitors rallied and levelled the scores shortly before the interval as Quint- Quinton's free kick found Richards, whose scuffed shot beat keeper Tim Brown and trickled inside the far post. However, Dulwich restored their lead almost immediately, Peter Idinii cutting inside and drilling an unstoppable shot past keeper Noel Imber. Town continued to give a good account of themselves in the second half and they were rewarded for their efforts, with nine minutes left when Brown was penalised for time-wasting and Quinton drilled the ball into the top corner from the resulting free kick to seal a point. A hectic spell of six games in 12 days begins for Enfield Town tomorrow night with a trip to Billericay Town at 7.45pm when they hope to have strengthened their squad by bringing in striker Raheem Sterling Parker from Boreham Wood. They then host Leyston on Saturday 3pm before going to Hampton and Richmond Borough on Tuesday at 7.45pm. Meanwhile, Town's under-21 side take on Oxay Jets reserves tonight, 7.45pm, in the final of the Hearts Intermediate Cup at the county ground in Letchworth. Rising British star Frank Buglioni will make the second defence of his WBO European Super Middleweight title against Sergei Komitsky at the Copper Box Arena on April the 12th. Big hitting Enfield H. Buglioni recorded his third back to back stoppage victory last month, defeating Italian Gaetano Nespro in five rounds. 
but Komitsky should re- represent his toughest challenge yet. The Belarus fighter has extended top Brit's Martin Murray and now the retired Ryan Rhodes the distance, and also ended the career of Jamie Moore when the popular Manchester fighter didn't come out for the seventh round. He's the best I've faced so far, Buglioni said. He's mixed with bigger names and has bags of experience, so it'll be a good gauge to see where I am in my career. He took big punches in Murray and Rhodes the distance and stopped more, so he's no mug. I'll be looking to make a real statement with a controlled, calculated and destructive performance. I'm not relying on punch power, even though I've stopped my last three opponents in a row. My fans love to see me involved in a good tear-up, but I'm moving up in leagues now, so I've got to use my brain. If the opportunity does come to take him out, I won't need a second chance. Tickets for the Power of London event are £40, £50, £70 and £100 and are available uh, from the box office 0844-249-1000. That's 0844-249-1000. Enfield 1893 ensured that they remain very much in the hunt for the Essex Senior League title by recording their sixth successive win on Monday. The Inform Ease produced a dominant display to romp to a 5-0 victory over Stansted, which saw them climb to within six points of table-topping Great Wakering Rovers with two games in hand, although the current leaders do have a better goal difference. Joe Kitsy, John Bricknell, Josh Sykes and Jamie Hayward all scored in the first 22 minutes to effectively kill off the game and Joe Bricknell rounded off an emphatic triumph by adding the fifth in the second half. We started the game very fast, manager Luke Giddings said. We talked before the match about trying to kill the game off early, and it was great that we managed to do that. I was able to take some players off in the second half to rest them, and it was another good performance. We've just got to keep it going now. Great Wakering are in the driving seat, but we're only six points behind them with two games in hand. We're not worrying about what other teams are doing, we're just trying to pick up as many points as possible and see where that takes us. Saturday had seen Billy Jones score both goals as the E's recorded a 2-0 win at home to Eton Manor. Enfield 18.93 entertain Ilford tomorrow night at 7.45pm before hosting Bowers and Pitsy on Saturday at 3pm. And before we have some what's on, I've got um, uh, an, a column from Monty Meth, the life president of the Enfield Over 50s Forum. When the Prince's Trust, one of our most respected charities, says at least 750,000 young Britons feel they have nothing to live for, it's surely time to get angry. The Trust has highlighted the plight of jobless youths aged 16 to 25. One in three long-term unemployed has contemplated suicide, while one in four has self-harmed, and 40% show signs of mental illness. If we fail to act, there is real danger that these young people will become hopeless, said the Trust's chief executive, Martina Milburn. Then I saw that the minimum wage for young workers will go up by 10 pence an hour, yes, 10 pence, from October, to £5.13 pence. Compare that with the £8.80 an hour London living wage due to rise in November. This is the minimum that Enfield Council pays to staff and nobody is on those degrading zero-hours contracts. So I'm pleased to see that London Mayor Boris Johnson saying that paying the London living wage is not only morally right, but makes good business sense too. Now I'd like to see the council flexing its muscles where it has influence to check where the fusion lifestyle which runs our leisure centres, the 51 local GP surgeries and more than 50 care homes in the boroughs can be persuaded to pay the London living wage. Not only jobs are needed, young and old need a living wage to help our local shops survive and thrive. Our Over 50s Forum intends to help the council's skills for work team in seeing that our youngsters have everything to live for. And now Shelley has some uh, what's on items. And we have Honk. There once was an ugly duckling. Finchley and Freon Barnet Operatic Society present a musical version of the beloved tale about the shunned little bird who surprised his critics. This is on at the Intimate Theatre, Green Lanes, Palmer's Green, from April the 1st to April the 5th. 
For details, ring 020-8482-6923. That's 020-8482-6923. A television presenter showed he had not forgotten his roots when he decided to save the dance studio that laid the foundations for his career. Former Dance Factory and Sports Round presenter Nigel Clark was determined to restore the North London Dance Studio to its former glory after he'd heard it had closed in 2013. The studio in Green Lane's Winchmore Hill opened 18 years ago and was a key component in the 36-year-old former dancer's success. Mr Clark of Arnold's Grove said, It was so sad to hear the news that the Academy was no longer running. I feel it gave me the chance I needed to achieve what I wanted. After joining the studio in 1995, the presenter says he learned of many of the skills he's used in his career. The CBBC presenter will reopen the Academy as Dance Studio Performing Arts in September and is looking for new recruits. He said, unlike the other big studios in London, this is far more intimate and allows the teachers to have a close relationship with each and every student. It allows people to develop quickly and will set you up for your future career. I couldn't let this opportunity pass me by and will be looking for between 10 and 20 people to sign up for our two-year course, which will be five days a week. Right, back to some more local news. A new programme has been launched to raise awareness about dementia. Enfield Borough Council introduced the Alzheimer's Society's Dementia Friends Scheme at the Civic Centre to coincide with the national launch of the Dementia Manifesto for London, which sets out how local authorities can create a dementia-friendly capital. The Alzheimer's Society's Dementia Friends Scheme aims to inform people about what it is like to live with the condition how to recognise the signs early enough and how to act on it. In Enfield, approximately 3,050 people over 65 are thought to have late-onset dementia and around 44% of them have a formal diagnosis. One of the key schemes aims of this scheme will be to focus on promoting an early diagnosis. Enfield Borough Council will launch a free exhibition this month to mark the centenary of the outbreak of the First World War. The exhibition will open on Thursday until the 11th of January next year in the Dugdale Centre in London Road and will look at the role the borough played in the war. Enfield was the home of the Royal Small Arms Factory in Enfield Lock and produced the Lee Enfield rifle that was used in the war by the British Army. Councillor Bambos Charalambos, Enfield Council's Cabinet Member for Culture, Leisure, Youth and Localism, said we should never forget the horror or degradation caused by the First World War, both for the soldiers who fought in the trenches and the civilian population, and this exhibition is a way of remembering those who suffered and gave their lives during this conflict, while also acknowledging the, re- the contribution and sacrifice the people of Enfield made to the war effort. A new centre for people with learning disabilities is nearing its completion. A topping out ceremony was held at the new options centre in Hartford Road, Enfield. The centre, a single storey building designed for up to 40 people with learning disabilities, will be run by Enfield Borough Council. The centre will have two rooms, a large hall, a kitchen and personal care facilities. An exhibition showcasing some designs for the new building was held earlier this month to coincide with the topping out ceremony. Councillor Don McGowan, Enfield Council's Cabinet Member for Adult Services, Care and Health, said, Centre users and staff have contributed their ideas to the design of the new building to improve the quality of service to users, but also vastly improving their experience. New Options is a terrific community resource for adults with a learning disability. It encourages independence and promotes confidence, health and friendship. The exhibition was a great example of what can be achieved. Lively, imaginative paintings are brimming with colourful ideas. Craft work included tapestries, pottery and bags. Enfield Council's New Options service deserves its new Bells building where it can continue to develop new activities and encourage excellent achievement in superb facilities, working closely with Friends of Albany to make some positive changes to the park. Families from across the borough and beyond enjoyed the first day of a farm's annual lambing weekend. 
Hundreds of people visited Forty Hall Farm on the Forty Hall Estate on Saturday for the start of its Lambing Open weekend. People were able to walk around the site to see and feed animals, enjoy a Shire horse display, watch a sheep shearing demonstration, and sample foods produced in and around Enfield. Claire Merrifield of Gordon Hill Enfield, who was visiting with her family, said, "We've been here before, and it's always nice to, for the kids to come and see the animals. Having a farm so close to you in London is one of the reasons why we love living in Enfield." Usually, when you come to visit, you don't see a whole the whole of the site, so it's nice to see the whole place and all the work being done here. Helen Gilchrist, who was visiting with her daughter and her sister from Edmonton, said, "It's been a really nice day out, and we've had such great fun. To have something like this on your doorstep is fantastic, and the kids love seeing the animals." The farm is run by Capel Manor College and is the only further education college in London specialising in learning about the environment. Farm manager Kate McGlever said. We've had a really good turnout, and it's good to see so many families here. Last year we had to deal with snow, but this year we've been blessed with some nice weather. Farmer Paul Granger said the day is all about letting the public see what we do and the work of the farm students who've been studying here. It's been quite busy with a lot of lambs being born, but we've had a really good turnout for the day. Repairs on a footpath through an Enfield park are due to begin after it disintegrated soon after being laid. The greenway through hilly fields in North Enfield was laid in December 2013, but fell apart in several places following torrential rain. Enfield Borough Council's cabinet member for Environment, Councillor Chris Bond, has now announced that the authority will be repairing the path as rapidly as possible. He said, while the damage to homes was remarkably light in Enfield as a result of the flood prevention work. We've been doing in recent years. Unfortunately, the very heavy and prolonged rain we had did cause damage to part of this greenway. It's a popular route, and people have been using it in great numbers. And we'll be repairing the damage as rapidly as possible. Friends of Hillfields Park Chairman Tony Clayden has welcomed the news, but is keen to see a more resilient path. He said, "I welcome the developments being made to the path." Currently, we aren't aware that anything has been decided on how the council will repair the path. The previous path fell apart, and some of the material ran into the brook because of the weather. But I hope the council will make it much more resilient. A dog was found in a garden in Enfield Town after being dumped over the wall with a bag of treats and a lead. The two-year-old tan Staffordshire Bull Terrier was found in a garden in Cecil Road around midnight on Friday, the fourteenth of March. The family who found the abandoned dog, which they nicknamed L- Lola, called the RSPCA. Kate Ford, the RSPCA inspector, called to the scene, examined the animal, and detected sti- stiffness in her back legs, suggesting that she'd been dropped from a height over the garden wall. And the inspector admitted that the sudden appearance of the healthy dog in a walled garden was a bit of a mystery. She said, "It's a bit of a strange one. On the one hand, Lola seems to have been cared for. She's in good condition, has a lovely temperament, and seems used to people. And then there was a bag of treats left nearby, a nice little touch which makes you think she'd been loved. It almost feels like a nice garden was chosen on purpose for her to be abandoned in. On the other hand, she was dumped and apparently over a high wall, which is quite some drop. Thankfully, initial stiffness in her rear leg seems okay, and a vet gave her a clean bill of health." She's such a lovely dog with a really sweet nature. I hope there's a happy ending round the corner for her. The dog is currently being cared for privately. The RSBCA is appealing for information about where Lola may have come from, and is asking anyone who might know to call the charity in confidence on o three double o one two three eighty eighteen o three double o one two three eighty eighteen. If no information comes available, the RSBCA will look to find her a new home. The mother of a boy whose life was devastated by meningitis has welcomed a move that could see the entire population protected against the disease. Carol Parry from Winchmore Hill, whose son Harvey had both legs amputated below the knee after contracting meningitis B as a baby, has been campaigning for a vaccine against the disease to be rolled out nationwide. Although the jab was approved for use in Europe in January two thousand and thirteen. The Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation last year initially advised the government against including the injection in the national vaccination program. 
however it was available privately. After extensive lobbying by charities and campaigners, the JCV1 looked again in, at the case for providing the vaccine nationwide. And last Friday, it was announced it had instructed the government to include the vaccine in the national programme, even though it had previously ruled it out on the basis that it was not cost-effective. Welcoming the move, Mrs Parry, whose eight-year-old son featured in a series of pictures by Anne Geddes to raise the profile of the campaign to roll out the vaccine nationwide, told the advertiser, This is good news for everybody. The fact that the government have now come on board is great. They have had a look at the overall impact on cost, and after weighing it up, they realise that if lots of people get meningitis, the cost to the local community purse and the strain on local services must go into the millions. That is why the committee has done this U-turn, which I believe is a sign of strength from this body and shows that they have listened to the evidence presented by campaigners and charities. If costs can be agreed between the government and the drugs manufacturer, the vaccine will be given to babies from just two months old. CCTV images have been released of a car which police are trying to trace in connection with a collision involving a pedestrian last month. A 61-year-old man was hit by a light-coloured car at 8.36pm on Friday the 28th of February outside Arnosgrave tube station in Bowes Road. The victim was taken to hospital by ambulance and was treated for a dislocated shoulder as well as of serious injuries to his legs. The driver of the car failed to stop at the scene. Police are appealing for anyone who can help identify the car from the footage to call the Serious Collision Investigation Unit on 020 8597 4874. That's 020 8597 4874. Or call Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800 555 111. A supermarket chain has come under criticism for refusing to employ a security guard at a store which has become a magnet for shoplifters. A meeting last week of police and Chase Ward residents, part of the Community Action Partnership in Enfield, was told by neighbourhood officers that the cooperative food store in Lancaster Road, Enfield, had lost about £14,000 worth of stock to Thebes since it reopened in November last year. It underwent a three-month refit following a serious rat infestation. Officers told the meeting at the Civic Centre in Silver Street, Enfield Town, there had been a surge in thefts at the new store due to the new layout. The tills are at the opposite end of the shop to the entrance, and aisles run horizontal to the tills, meaning staff are unable to see along them. And some of the most expensive stock, including meat, has been placed close to the shop's entrance. Annette Dreblow, chairwoman of the panel, which meets every five weeks, said, There is a very good reason why the majority of shops and supermarkets have their tills located next to the exits. Apparently, the co-op chooses not to do this. In my opinion, and those of the committee, it is better our police officers direct their resources to help others in the community rather than those who have the resources to arrange their own security. Chase Ward Councillor Tom Waterhouse added... If they're facing the prospect of losing £40,000 a year from shoplifters, it seems ridiculous not to take steps to combat it. A spokeswoman for Enfield Police said, Officers have been providing the supermarket chain with crime prevention advice, adding, A number of recommendations have been left with the co-op to decide how they wish to proceed. A co-op spokeswoman said, As well as making considerable improvements to the CCTV monitoring of the store, we are looking at proposals to change the store layout, as well as a number of other measures to help deter criminals. A head teacher has welcomed news that his school's kitchen will undergo a revamp. Jez Fisher, head teacher at Brimstown Primary School in Green Street, Enfield, is delighted that Enfield Council has agreed to pay for a £3 million makeover of the school's kitchen facilities. The school was opened in 2008 and Mr Fisher is looking forward to replacing the old and noisy dining hall, which serves 660 infant and junior pupils. He said, our current kitchen is very old and is noisy. Acoustically, the new building should be fantastic and we've welcomed this latest news. Mr Fisher claims that the school was due to have an upgraded kitchen a few years ago, but the demand for places meant the school has had to wait for the opportunity. 
He said the revamp will also improve accessibility to the hall. At the moment, the children have to go through the car park to reach the site, which means more staff have to supervise their trip. Enfield Council's cabinet member for children and young people, Councillor Ifa Orhan, said this initiative will make a real difference to our young people by providing a nicer and more welcoming environment for children to eat their lunch. It will also upgrade the kitchen facilities at Brimsdown to give staff access to state-of-the-art facilities. Improving our kitchens is an investment in our children's futures because it means we can ensure pupils enjoy at least one healthy and nutritious meal each day. Plans on when the building work will start and finish are yet to be agreed. A supermarket has launched a new service for shoppers to collect food from two Enfield underground stations. The Click and Collect service was launched by Tesco and Transport for London at Cockfosters Underground Station in Cockfosters Road and Arnos Grove Underground Station in Bowes Road earlier this month. Customers will be able to pick up groceries during time slots from 12pm to 3pm or 5pm to 8pm. Commuters travelling via the Piccadilly Line stations will be able to pick up groceries from a Tesco van in the station car park. Collection is free until April the 27th. The NHS is urgently appealing for donors of two blood groups to help rebuild its stocks. People with an O-negative or B-negative blood group in Enfield are being asked to donate blood after it was revealed that stocks here are at their lowest level for four years. The NHS has now organised a session on Thursday the 27th of March at Trent Park Golf Club in Bramley Road. There will also be a session at Angel Community Centre on Friday the 4th of April between 12.45pm and 7.15pm. John Latham, Assistant Director for Marketing at NHS Blood and Transplant, said we constantly monitor donations and blood stocks for all blood, group, blood groups throughout the year to ensure that we have enough blood to meet the demand of hospitals and patients and have adequate contingency stocks. Stocks of O-negative and B-negative are lower than we would like them to be, and we are asking for both O-negative and B-negative blood donors in particular. O-negative is typically known as the universal donor, and approximately 7% of the UK, blood, of the UK sorry, has this blood group. B-negative is rarer, accounting for only 2% of the UK's population. To make an appointment to donate blood, please call 0300 123 2323. That's 0300 123 2323. And now we've reached the end of our programme for this week, and thank you very much for listening. Sorry it's a bit of a, uh, an unusual broadcast, um, and sorry again that you'll receive your tape a little later than normal as a result. Um, so th thank you to my mum for reading this week with me, and Keith de Jersey and I will be on the production team copying the tape on Monday, and uh, we hope we'll be back to normal service next week. So from us here, it's goodbye. Goodbye. Please remember to turn over the address label in your postal packet, put the cassette into the packet, and return it to us as soon as possible in readiness for the next edition. Don't forget you can call Diane de Jersey regarding any help you may require in connection with the Enfield Talking newspaper. She's your listener representative and will be happy to help you. You can call her on 020 8805 6578. That's 020 8805 6578. The Enfield Talking newspaper will be with you again in one week's time. <laughs>